We're in our series Acts, so we got to make some noise. We need some more energy in here. So let's make, give some noise for Ron Johnson. Oh, the best hype man. Hey, that was pretty good. Good morning. Uh, how many of you uh, are John Maxwell fans? Got some Maxwell fans. He loves to say, he's like a spiritual leadership guru. And, and one of his famous axioms is that leadership is influence. It's not a title. It's, it's not a position. It's influencing other people. So how many of you would say in your area of expertise, maybe you're a mom and you're like great at diapers and raising kids who are well-adjusted human beings. Maybe you're uh, an attorney and you, I don't know, you sue people. <laughs> maybe you're a doctor, you fix hemorrhoids, whatever you do, right? You're like, you flip houses, you all have these areas of expertise. How many of you would say where, where you've been trained, you are a leader, you have influence? Raise your hands. Lots of leaders in the room. Lots of leaders. Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay. So let me, let me ask you this. You still have your hand up. That's good, man. That's a confident young leader. I like that. Um, how many of you would say, what? More than mom. Okay. More confident than mom. Okay, I got gotcha. you. You know, it's a dialogue today. Let's, let's say. How many of you would say, though, let me, let's take this leadership thing uh, another step. How many of you would say that you are a spiritual leader? Raise your hands. Okay. Hey, this is better than the last service. Way to go, you guys. We had like three hands go up. All right. So I'd say maybe 25% of you just raise your hand. I, I want to help all of you get to the place where you raise your hand today. Okay. If leadership is influence, we all have a spiritual impact on the people around you, uh, either for better or for worse. But I want to see if we can raise the level of spiritual self-esteem in our church and get past some of our spiritual leadership inferior complexes because that is what God needs us to, to do in order to have the kind of influence he wants us to have to bring more of God's kingdom to earth as it is in heaven and make disciples who make disciples for generations to come. So I, I think part of the problem is we, um, we, we look at people like me who, like this is like a career path for me. Go to seminary and get degrees and you do seminars and our staff, they're always learning and stuff and talking about how to make an impact and how to read the Bible and teach the Bible. And we go, let's just let the pros do the ministry, Okay. Do, do, anybody guilty of that? Like, let, I'll just bring my friends and let, let's let the pros do what they do. Let's outsource spiritual growth and sharing the gospel to the, to the people who do this all the time. And that has never been the way God wants it to happen. Because I can't be there when your young child says, hey, mommy, daddy, can you tell me how to be a Christian? You can't call me up and say, oh, just talk to Ron. Okay? Um, I, I'm not going to be there. Jason's not going to be there. Other staff members are not going to be there. When someone at work who's depressed says, you know, I'm thinking about committing suicide. Um, we're not going to be there when your roommate starts asking questions about Jesus and saying, hey, how could a good God allow war to happen and there be all these horrible things that happen to good people? Well, what's God think about transgender people? We're not going to be there to answer those questions in those key moments when people are spiritually open and they need you to influence them in a really positive way. So today, collectively, we just pray with me that we can, we can raise our spiritual leadership, self-esteem as a church. Will you pray that with me? Let's pray. Father, I, I, I thank you that you've called us, all of us, to influence people spiritually. And, and your plan has never been for the pros to do the ministry, but for everyday disciples to, to share their faith and, and make other disciples and bring the, the hope of Jesus Christ and the grace and the forgiveness and the peace of Christ that our world is so thirsty for. It's always been your plan that, that all of us would do that. And so will you please uh, raise our spiritual leadership self-esteem today in Jesus' name and for his glory. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. Okay. So if you're new to Restoration, we're in Acts. We've been in Acts for many months now. We're halfway through Acts. We're in Acts 14. There are 28 chapters. And so today I'll be in Acts 14, 21 through 28. Let's just jump in uh, with the first four verses. Uh, they preached the gospel in that city, Derbe. We'll get to that in a minute. And, and when a large number of disciples... Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, places I'm sure you've vacationed in the past there, uh, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. And they said, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church, and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord, to whom they had put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came into Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia, all these cities I'm sure you're very familiar with, right? Yeah, right we need a map. I'm the, map. I'm the cartographer on the teaching team. I like maps. So let me explain what's happening here. I mean, if you're new to scripture, Apostle Paul was this guy who wrote most of the New Testament, and he was a missionary, one of three missionary journeys, and his home base was, was over here, Antioch in modern-day Syria. 
And often when he would do these, these missionary journeys, he would do like an out and back course. He'd go out one direction and share the gospel with people, and people would come to faith, Jews and Gentiles both alike would come to faith, and then he'd go back and he'd strengthen them in various ways. So he started in Antioch, and we've been kind of following his journey along, and he goes through Cyprus, and he's up in modern-day Turkey, and he's just gone through several cities, and now he's on his way back in this passage, and he's, he's strengthening these believers on his way back to Antioch. Are you following me? All these towns you've never heard of? Hey, on the way out, he's, he's making disciples. On the way back, he's strengthening the disciples. So how did he strengthen the disciples? Two ways. Uh, he, he told them to expect hardships. He says, you're going to go through a lot of hardship to enter into the kingdom of God. This is a promise in the Bible that we don't like to claim. We don't put this promise on our bumper stickers or our mirrors, right? Philippians 1.29 says, it's been granted unto you not only to believe on Christ, but to suffer for his sake. How's that for a cheery message? You follow Jesus, you're going to go through hardship. You're, you're going to suffer. Now, why did he do that in order to strengthen these new believers? Because he was trying to adjust their expectations, you know, often when you, you come to faith, you're in the honeymoon season, and like, you know, Jesus is so close to you, and you have all this intimacy, and you're like, this is going to be great, and you don't expect to experience the fine print in the Bible. You're going to suffer. The only way we become holier, and we are formed back into the image of Christ, is often through suffering. God does his best work through suffering. Also, if you share your faith, and you try to exercise some spiritual influence, and you lead people, you're going to get rejected sometimes. Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted. And we have to think persecution has to do with like people in other countries who get imprisoned for sharing their faith. But we experience mild doses of persecution and hardship when we try to exercise spiritual influence. So um, last week I was in here, we were going to Iowa and we drove through Nebraska. Very exciting trip, by the way. <laughs> I highly recommend this trip. And, 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 and in Nebraska, you have to, I, I drive a Sequoia. We'll come back to that in a few minutes, which is basically a house on four tires. And so it just sucks up gas. And so you stop a lot at, at gas stations if you're driving a Sequoia. And so I made it my purpose. Every time I would stop and I would buy some gas and go in and get a snack, I would ask the person behind the, behind the uh, cash register, can I pray for you? And I, I try to make this a regular practice. And you know, when you go to these little gas stations in the middle of nowhere, there's no one there. Like it's just you and that person. So you can just make that your little church for a couple minutes. So most of the time people said, yeah, man, I, get, I, I need prayer. Uh, my mom is sick, or I'm about to move, and I could use some prayer. I would pray th for these people. And, and then this one guy, I asked him, hey, can I pray for you? And he said, uh, no. And he kind of backed away. And one of the tools we use here at Restoration to know like, how we can test people's spiritual temperature is, when we bring up spiritual matters, do they lean in or lean away? And I find most of the time people lean in. Like when you say, can I pray for you? I'd love to pray for you. Can I pray some specific personal prayer request that you might have? They usually lean in. But when they lean away, it kind of hurts. Like, I, I feel like I should be used to this by now. But when this one guy said, nah, man, and looked at me like I was an alien, like from another planet, it kind of hurt a little bit. Okay. Well, well, Paul is saying, you need to expect this. And, and they had just seen him suffer. Like he, so he goes down to Derby, and he, then he comes back, like an out and back kind of run. And he goes through Lystra. And they had just seen him stoned in Lystra. Last week, if you were here, uh, you heard Jeff talk about how there was a, a guy who was lame from birth. And God used Paul to heal this man. And then afterwards, there was like this popularity contest going on between Paul and Barnabas and these Jewish leaders. And so the Jewish leaders, they stoned him. And they left him for dead. If you missed that message, Jeff did a great job, outstanding message, listen to it. And then he comes back to Lystra, and he's saying, you have to go through a lot of hardship to enter the kingdom of God. And they're like, they're like well, duh, we just saw you almost get stoned. So we want to right adjust our expectations. We should expect that we will suffer and sometimes experience hardship as we grow in the ways of Jesus and as we share Jesus with other people. So how's that for encouragement? <clears throat> yeah, highly, highly encouraging. Um, the other way he strengthened them was by raising up leaders. So realize when he goes down to Derby and now he's going back on this out and back course, he's going back and he's talking to spiritual uh, leaders who have only been following Jesus for like six to eight months. He's calling them elders. They're brand new Christians, and he's laying hands on them and praying for them and saying, you're a leader, you're a leader, you're a leader. And they're like, what? I just became a Christian. I don't know the Bible. They didn't have Bibles. I, I, I just learned about Jesus like a few months ago, and you're making me a leader? Paul's like, yeah, you have what it takes. Leadership does not require we reach a certain level of maturity. 
before we start influencing leading people. We're going to come back to that in a few minutes. Let's continue with the passage, though. Um, verses 26 through 28, from Italia, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles, and they stayed there a long time with the disciples. So they've returned home to Antioch, Syria, Antioch, and this was like their home base. This was their spiritual family. And you see this in Paul. He went on three missionary journeys every time he came home, and he spent time with his spiritual family. Well, restoration, this is us. We go out every single week. We commission you to go outside, go into the, your work world, into your neighborhoods, and your friendship circles and groups, and be spiritual influencers. And then we come back together on the weekends. We come back into our simple churches, and we get spiritual nourishment. We heal. We get built up. We get, we get equipped. Um, tonight, I'll meet with my spiritual family. And we'll talk about what happened this last week. We're a church of simple churches. If you're new to restoration, a simple church is just a group of a handful of people who are trying to grow in the ways of Jesus, love God, love people, and make disciples. And so we'll get together. We'll talk about what happened this week and uh, the, the conversations we had and our attempts to help people grow in the ways of Jesus. And then we'll encourage each other to have a meal together. And then we'll set some goals to go out next week and do it again. And I need that every single week to build me up and to encourage me. Same thing on the weekends. You know, we're out serving during the week, we come back together, and we come for nourishment. This is our spiritual family. We hear the word of God. We, we worship. We're led by worship leaders into the presence of God. We go in the back corner. If you want prayer, um, at the end of the service, we offer prayer for people. We pray for healing. We pray for encouragement. We, we pray for wisdom. And then Kyle will say something at the end of the service like, hey, church is just beginning. As you're going out the door, hang out, get to know each other, encourage each other, love each other out on the porch. We need a spiritual family. We need these gatherings where we encourage each other, build each other up. We need simple churches where we can be more intimate and, and be more accountable and use our various gifts to build one another up. So I'm going to share the stories of three everyday missionaries in our church that have gone out this last week to 10 days and done some pretty cool things. So first of all, we have Jay Tindra. Jay Tindra Singh, he was on, in the last service. Uh, this is Tahoe. I'm kind of jealous. And uh, Jay has around 30 simple churches now here in Denver. And he primarily reaches Indians, Pakistanis, and Afghan refugees. And he reaches uh, mainly, mainly Hindu and, and Muslim people groups. And so people in his simple churches here in Denver have gone to other cities, and they get in their you know, friendship circles, and they begin to share their faith, and then people come to faith, and they start simple churches. So in the last 10 days, uh, Jay went to Salt Lake City, where there's like three or four simple churches that have been started out of disciples that were here in Denver that went and started these simple churches. And then he went from there to Reno because some people from Reno came to Salt Lake City and met these people. They shared their faith with them, and they talk, took the gospel back to Reno. And so Jay went there to strengthen those churches. And then he went to Sacramento because some people in Reno reached some people in Sacramento. And the people in Sacramento said, you know what? You've got to meet our, our friends in San Francisco. There's like a big neighborhood full of people who are Indian. And so he went there and strengthened those churches. And they said, you need to go to San Jose because we got some friends that are starting a simple church out of our simple church in San Jose. And Jay's like, okay, time out. I got a daughter who's got a basketball game. I got to go back home. Okay? So during this little missionary journey of Jay's, 74 people were baptized this last 10 days. Can we put our hands together for that? Isn't that awesome? Jay is an everyday missionary, albeit with some pretty significant spiritual gifts that God used this week. But he comes back every single week. He was in the corner you know, winning prayer today. He came back tired. He needs his spiritual family. Another story. Mark O'Brien. Hey, Mark. Good looking guy, Mark O'Brien. Uh, Mark usually watches online because his church is kind of different. He has a series of churches on Colfax. He calls it the Boulevard of Hope. Is Mark in the house, though? I don't see Mark. He, he's here every once in a while. He said he might come by today. So Mark, uh, his churches meet on street corners, under bridges, and in tent cities because the people that Mark has a burden for are homeless. And, and last week, uh, we, we raised like a couple thousand bucks from you guys. And we gave it to, to Mark because we knew about the cold snap coming through. And so he put people in hotel rooms. He got sleeping bags for people. He got little sterno stoves, those little camping stoves so they could cook. And I believe Mark literally saved lives this week. When a homeless person dies, you don't hear about it. But it happens all the time, especially when it's like below zero degrees outside. He literally saved lives. 
he estimates that maybe 40 people were saved this week. Is that cool? That's probably worth clapping for too, huh? Okay. I saved the best for last. Uh, Bridget, she was in the last service. This is Bridget. Um, that's our old building. And uh, some of you guys know her. She was baptized in November. Very new in her faith. And she goes to our multiply training events on Wednesday night where we teach people how to grow in the ways of Jesus and how to develop spiritual habits and disciplines to be formed into the image of Christ. And we teach people how to share their faith, their story, and God's story with other people. And so like two weeks ago, we taught her how to share the gospel with like one verse. And the very next week, she actually did that. Like she immediately applied what she learned and she shared her faith with a friend. Now, her friend didn't come to faith, but I believe over time, she probably will. And I think God smiles at that step of faith, that ministry that Bridget you know, created, that ministry moment, as much as he does Jay baptizing 74 people or Mark saving 40 people from, from death, possibly. You know, God celebrates the small steps that people take. So can we put our hands together for Bridget? Like, the first time you share your faith, it's pretty scary, and she did a great job, and I'm really, really proud of her. So we are all called to be everyday missionaries who leave this space and leave our simple churches to minister to people with our own unique stories, our own unique giftedness. We are called to minister to people and help them learn to follow Jesus as we are, one stumbling step after another, and grow into the image of Christ. So how do we overcome our spiritual leadership low self-esteem? Am I the only one that sometimes wrestles with a spiritual leadership inferiority complex? Raise your hands if you got it. Come on, people. All right, now we're getting honest. At least half of you were. Uh, yeah, I still struggle with this, and I'm like, I'm one of the pros. I, get, I, get, like, I went to seminary and stuff. I still wrestle every time I even come up on this stage. Like, why am I up here? Why do I deserve to do this? I, I know myself. And so how do we overcome our, our low self-esteem when it comes to our ability to influence people? Well, one simple answer Paul gives us in this text is we have to focus more on Jesus and what he can do than on ourselves and what we can do. We have to focus more on Jesus, his power, his wisdom, his ability, his authority, and less on our power, our wisdom, and our authority. That's how we overcome our low spiritual leadership self-esteem. So I see this in verse 23. Uh, Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church, and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. Who put their trust in the Lord? These, these young followers of Jesus that Paul is turning into elders, pastors, elder and pastor in the Bible are, are, are used synonymously. He's, he's saying, you can do this. You can lead these simple churches in these different cities because you've trusted in God. Chances are they were just young people, young in their faith, who were just faithful. They took what they knew, what they'd been given by Paul and Barnabas, and they shared it. They said, hey, you can come to my house. We'll have a meal. We'll pray. I can tell you what they told me. And that's how they became leaders. But they had their eyes focused more on Jesus and his power than themselves and their power. And, and where did Paul learn to do this? Where did he get this idea that you don't need like professionals, you don't need seminary graduates, you don't need people who've been in church like their whole lives in order for them to be leaders of, of small little house churches? He probably got that idea from Jesus. So I, I mentioned this a few weeks ago in a message. The disciples were 18 to 21 years old, approximately, and, and Jesus, after he rises from the dead and he ascends to be with the Father, he gives them the keys to the church. It's like giving a 12-year-old keys to a car. Like, they're like, what? I'm not ready for this. I'm only like 21 years old. And these were very, very imperfect people. So you, you've got James and John on, on the way to Jerusalem where Jesus was crucified. On the way, as they're, as they're walking along together with Jesus, they're like, hey, Jesus, you know, when you go into Rome, and, and you start to like take things over and you go kind of Braveheart and Gladiator and you overthrow the Roman Empire like you're going to do. We'd like to be at your right hand and your, your, your left hand, okay? We'd like to be your vice president and your secretary of state. How about that, Jesus? I, we think we got, your, we got your back. We can help you out. Jesus is like, oh my gosh, I've been wasting my time. We're, this is not about a military campaign. This isn't the Ukraine or Russia. This is about a spiritual kingdom. They still didn't get it. They were prideful, even narcissistic in their spirituality. Then you got, you got Peter. Peter becomes the leader, like the, the lead pastor of the early church. And just 50 days before he preaches his first sermon, and these young guys become the leader of these churches, he, he uh, cuts a guy's ear off in the garden. 
takes his sword out, and some guy's trying to arrest Jesus, hacks the guy's ear off. Jesus does like a little supernatural plastic surgery, you know, kind of fixes that thing, you know. <laughs> Says, Peter, that's, you're missing the point here, literally. Like, you're not getting it. It's not about war, okay? And then that same night, uh, Peter denies Jesus three times. And he finishes by cursing out a girl who kept saying, I think you were one of his disciples, weren't you? And he, you know, cusses her out. Fifty days later, he's preaching a sermon. 3,000 people get saved. And he's leading the church. These were not mature, highly developed disciples of Jesus. But they were available, and they kept their eyes more on Jesus than they did on themselves. And so they didn't shrink back when Jesus said, go lead. It's time to exercise spiritual influence. So there is hope for us. Those of us who don't feel that mature, who, who don't feel very perfected as, as we're journeying with Jesus, there's hope for us. And I want to share a story with you right now that I'm going to regret at 4 a.m. I'm going to go, I can't believe I told that story. I, I, I do this frequently. I go, I, I tell stories and then later I go, oh, I should not have told that story. So, but I think someone here probably needs this story today, okay? So lest you put people on this stage on a pedestal, uh, I, I went skiing with my son for the first time like three weeks ago, and he's four years old. I got two little kids, two and four, and I got adult kids. So it's his first time on the red carpet, you know, and actually he's pretty proud of him. He kind of did some curves and stuff, like you're getting this. Um, on the way there, though, uh, I had a couple incidents. I, I mentioned that I drive a, a Sequoia, and it's huge. And so I never used to get honked at, but now I'm in the Sequoia, this house on wheels. I get honked at all the time. So I'm, I'm getting out of 25 from Alameda and Santa Fe, and I don't know what I did. I must have been in the lane too much. This, this guy behind me honks at me. I'm like, dude, it's my Sabbath. Chill out, okay? So <clears throat> then, then I, I go up the mountain, and I'm, I'm in my, my Sabbath space. Yeah, I'm all restful. And I'm like, this is going to be fun. My son's going to learn how to ski. We're going to get some cute pictures for Instagram. And, and then I go to Dillon. You all know this place. Like, you, you get off it on a Dillon. You get your gas there. You get your energy bar. You know what I'm talking about? And then you have to get over three lanes and get in the left turning lane to do a U-turn to get back on 25. Who knows what I'm talking about? Okay, almost all of us because you live here. And so as I'm waiting for the cars to go by so I can get in said left turning lane, this guy behind me, this aggro young guy, starts honking on his horn. I'm like, dude, chill out. What's up with people today? Don't you know it's my Sabbath? So he honks at me, but I'm kind of recovering from that. We have a great time, you know, playing with Chester on the Hill, a little red carpet thing. Then on the way back, I'm kind of tired, you know, like from chasing Chester all day. So I'm, my, 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 uh, my, my guard's down a little bit. And then we, we get some ice because our refrigerator went out last week or two weeks ago. And I'm getting ice there on, by Downing Alameda. And I'm at a stop sign as I'm coming home, my final home stretch. And somebody else honks at me. And this time, I just didn't, I didn't have any resistance anymore. I did what any pastor, I think, would have done after being honked at three times. I flipped the guy off. Yeah, I did. Anybody of you, any of you get flipped off three Fridays ago, you know, by a guy in a sequoia? I like, my, I, the first thing I thought was, oh my gosh, what if it's somebody in my church? <laughs> and, and my wife, she's never done this ever. She's like so holy. And she's like, Ron, the kids are in the back seat. I'm like, it's dark out. They can't see. <laughs> now, to my credit, I had not flipped anybody off for years. <laughs> okay, maybe weeks, maybe weeks. But it had been a long time, okay? And I, it, was like, it was like a partial bird. You know, it was like the full, like when in my 20s, it would have been double fisted out the window, but it was like the, just the, the third digit on my finger. So it didn't completely count, but I did, I did do it. See, I got a ways to go. And don't we all? And so if I waited, like two days later, I'm preaching on the stage that evening, I'm leading my simple church talking about Jesus. If, if I waited until all my uh, besetting sins were, were behind me, uh, I wouldn't be up here. I, I would have never led. We have to remind ourselves, God's not looking for perfect people. He's not even looking for super mature people. He's looking for people who are more focused on him and what he can do than ourselves and what we can do. He's looking for people who are faithful, who it will take what God has given them and faithfully pass it on to other people. So hopefully that helped you a little bit today. You, you want to raise your leadership self-esteem in the spiritual realm. Don't wait uh, until you, you're no longer watching porn or until you're no longer drinking too much or your bad marriage is, is better or you no longer flip people off. 
or you love Kansas City Chief fans. <laughs> that could take a while for some of us. Don't wait. Okay. Focus on God and his perfection, his wisdom, his power, not your own, and start leading. So how do we grow our, our spiritual leadership? How do we grow in our influence? Uh, got a couple things for you. First of all, just start trying stuff. Just start trying to do things. So the, these young followers of Jesus, they just started doing stuff. We don't know exactly what they did, but we know that the practice of the early church was people would just gather in their homes. They didn't have buildings. They didn't have stages and lights. They would just gather in their homes. They would have meals, and they would encourage each other and pray for each other and, and say, hey, I, I heard this story about Jesus. One time he did this. And they would just pass on faithfully what they had already learned. And so when Paul and Barnabas come through these cities, they're like, hey, I see that you're faithful. You're trusting. You're doing stuff. You're doing stuff. You've been trying a lot of things. You know what? You just might be a leader. And they prayed and fasted, and as they got to know these people who were trying things, they go, you're a leader, you're a leader, you're a leader, so now go lead. So just start trying a bunch of stuff. And, and then take what you have been given and faithfully pass it on. Uh, a few weeks ago, I did a message on, like, duckling discipleship, and we talked about the ducks and the geese in Wash Park and how you always get the, the mother duck or the mother goose, and you got the little babies behind it, and that's how we grow as Christians, we, we focus on Jesus. We keep our eyes on Jesus. But there are always leaders in front of us that have something to teach us. So as other leaders are following Jesus, other people of spiritual influence are following Jesus, we take what we've learned from them and we give it to the, the ducks and the geese following us. Okay? That, that's how we grow in our leadership. We faithfully pass on to others what we've been taught. And so that's what the leaders in these churches were doing. They saw Barnabas and Paul like healing people and praying for people and telling stories. They just did the same thing. Um, if you want to learn how uh, we at Restoration, how we do ministry, what you can do on the weekends here to build up our spiritual family, what you can do to like start a simple church or how you can become a part of one, how to make disciples. Uh, we have a couple opportunities for you. One, we, we have a Next Steps class coming up. Jason uh, just mentioned it earlier, Jason or Billy. Um, it's coming up uh, next weekend, March 6th. I can't believe March is already here. 12 to 1.30, I think it's gonna be over in the chapel. I'm not sure, but more details next week. And it will teach you like who we are as a church, what we believe, our mission, our vision, but we'll help you get connected and just start trying stuff. We need all kinds of leaders. We need people to make coffee and greet people and do worship and lead simple churches. We need a lot of people to disciple our kids and our students. There's all kinds of ways you can serve around here and just start trying stuff in order to grow in your spiritual influence. So come check that out next week. Um, the other thing I would encourage you to do is get training. Like the reason we feel competent in our careers is because we got the certificate, we got the degree, we did the apprenticeship, we did all the seminars, we keep reading the books. And so we feel competent selling houses and flipping homes and being doctors and stuff. Well, we need to do the same thing as disciples. We need to take the time to invest in ourselves and actually be trained. And so we're about to finish this quarter, a Wednesday night training event we do every Wednesday night, 10 weeks. Uh, we go through this training called Zoomy.training. It's how to make disciples, how to grow spiritually yourself, how to feed yourself, and, and how to start simple churches. We're going to start a new one in April. Is that right? April 6th. Uh, that'll start every Wednesday night back over in the chapel. It's kind of fun. We, we eat a little bit, and we get around tables, and we grow together. And these tables become like peer mentoring groups after the training's over. Now, a lot of you have told us, hey, I just can't commit to something every single week right now. I'm leading a simple church. I can't do that also. I'm trying to be on the weekends, whatever. So we've heard you. We're going to do a retreat uh, May 6th through 7th, Friday afternoon through Saturday. Um, this is especially helpful for those of you who are parents and you've got kids and stuff to go on during the week. And we'll try to condense the training. The weekly training is better because it gives you a chance to incorporate and, and practice over a longer period of time what you're learning. But if you can't do that, go to the weekend and we'll train you and equip you to not only feed yourself and grow spiritually, but also to learn how to feed other people. You up for that? Can you do that? Okay, cool. All right, I'm going to end with a story. Uh, I read this story this last week. I think I've read it before, though. It's, it's, about a, it's about a group called the New England Rescue Society. Okay? And uh, they existed in the early 1900s, and they actually built, I believe, that lighthouse, which has been renovated several times. And they were kind of like a precursor to the Coast Guard, you know, saving people when they would get shipwrecked. And so when they first began, they would train hard and they would, they would build up boats that they could go out and you know, help people when they're drowning if they got hit on rocks. And then over the years, the, the ships got really smart. They saw the lighthouse that these, this society built and they go, okay, don't get too close to that or we're going to hit a rock and we're going to you know, run our ship. And so for years, they didn't do any rescues and they kind of got a little uh, too content. So they stopped training 
they stopped repairing their, their boats that would go out and save people. And they became like a club that they would gather with their friends and family and they would reminisce about the old days when they actually saved people's lives. And they'd party and dance. And one night they were doing that. They were just having a lot of fun in this little clubhouse. And sure enough, that night, a, a boat crashed against the rocks and they went outside and they were helpless. They were out of shape. They no longer knew what to do. Their boats were in disrepair. And they just stood there watching people drown and die. It's a true story. Well, Restoration Family, this happens to churches all the time. They start off and they're on mission. They realize they're called to bring heaven to earth. That They're called to bring the hope of Jesus Christ into the world. They're called to literally save lives, turning people from death to life, from a Christless eternity to the hope of heaven and resurrection in the future. So often churches forget their mission and they become like these little clubs that just exist for themselves. Let us never become that church, ever. Instead, let us step into our spiritual leadership, step into the influence that we have been given. Every single week we go out of here and we've got neighbors and friends and family members who need us to have enough courage and enough faith in God to speak up and to share with them the hope of Jesus Christ. There are people in here and out there who are living lives of quiet desperation. All around us, there is depression and anxiety and suicide and, and hatred and fear. More than ever, our world needs hope. And the only hope that truly lasts is the hope of Jesus Christ. Only the hope and the joy and the love of Christ transcends all circumstances. And so today, I hope you will go out and step into your influence and speak up and share your faith and share your desire to minister to people and pray with people and help them find hope in Jesus Christ and become disciples themselves who are being formed into the image of God as they follow Jesus Christ. So I want to end by, by praying a blessing over you. You can hold your hands out or you can pray with me. Uh, may you step into your spiritual leadership May you use your influence to lead people to Jesus and his ways. May God use you to turn people back from death to life. And may Jesus come back soon to restore once and for all our broken, sinful, war-torn world and bring heaven and earth together once again. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We're going to participate now in the Lord's Supper. And if you're new to restoration, I'll tell you how we do it here in just a second. But this Lord's Supper is going to be a little different today. When we take the Lord's Supper, we remember that, that Jesus Christ went to the cross to help us make peace with God. A apart from Jesus Christ, we are not at peace with God. In fact, the Bible says the wrath of God remains on us because of what we've done to this world and our sinful nature. But because Christ went to the cross, we can have peace with God. He substituted on the cross his righteousness, his holiness for our sinfulness. And so we remember this as we come to the table. We remember that we have been given peace with God. That when God sees us now, he sees us as holy and righteous and forgiven and loved. And then we're going to take that peace and bring it out into the world. And most of us, we're pretty disturbed right now, at least I hope you are, about what's happening in Eastern Europe. And so as we're participating in the Lord's Supper today, let's pray. Let's pray that this war comes to an end quickly. Let's not forget that the most powerful weapons are not cruise missiles and MiGs and nuclear warheads. The most powerful weapon in the world is prayer. And let's not forget that the, the war, it says in Ephesians 6, is not ultimately against flesh and blood, but against the powers and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. There is a spiritual war going on and the enemy wants to take out lives. And so let's pray that peace would come to the Ukraine very, very soon. Can I get an amen? We can do that? Okay. So the way we take communion here uh, is we remember, first of all, that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he broke bread with his spiritual family. And he, he said, this is my body given for you do this in memory of me. 
And that same evening, he poured wine. And he said, this wine represents a new covenant, a new way of knowing God, a way of peace and forgiveness and mercy. And he told us, as long as we eat of this bread and we drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until Jesus comes back and restores all things. And so if the communion service would please come forward. Um, at restoration, we come down one side of the aisle, we go back the other side of the aisle, we take a piece of the bread, we dip it into, into the juice. Um, obviously, this is optional. If you don't feel like you should come, for whatever reason, you don't have to. Uh, but if you're here and you're like, I don't know if I really have peace with God. You're talking about peace with God. I don't know if I have that. How do I get that? How do I, how do I become a part of the family of God so that I'm, I can take communion with integrity? You give up on your, your self-righteousness project. You give up on your, your self-help project, trying to make yourself good enough to win God's approval. You, you move from that paradigm and you move over to the Jesus paradigm, which is you trust what he's done for you. You trust in his goodness, his forgiveness, his mercy. And you follow him as your savior and your Lord. And if that's where you are today and you wanna do that in your heart, just right now say, Jesus, I receive your forgiveness. I receive the peace you wanna give me with God. And I give you my life for yours. And if that's your prayer, if that expresses the truth of your heart, right now in your heart, say amen. And then come to the table. You are a child of God. Let's pray. Let's thank God. Love you guys.